Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let's do that to you. Let's stand to the
of chapter 1. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever.
know, the highest calling that we have on earth is to worship God. And uh, everybody can do that. You know, some people cannot uh, do a lot of great things, but all of us can worship God. And that's our high calling, is to exalt Him. The Westminster Catechism says, uh, uh, the chief end of man is to glorify God Amen. and to enjoy Him forever. When God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Bible says that they walked together in the cool of the evening and they fellowshiped. And Adam, no doubt, just said, God, you are so wonderful. I just love you so much. And uh, that's, that's what he wants from us. In fact, the great commandment, the greatest of all the commandments is to love the Lord Amen. with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we call that worship. You just look through the Bible for the word worship, you'll find that it's a command to worship the Lord. Come and worship. Bow down and worship. Worship the Lord. And so I want us to think today about what it means to worship God. And I want us to look at the, the ideal worshiper in the Bible. And it's Mary. Sometimes as uh, Protestants, we, we kind of shy away from Mary because the Roman Catholics seem to make so much of Mary but the truth is, she was, in fact, a remarkable and an amazing woman. She was an ideal believer. She heard the Word of God. Amen. She believed the Word of God. She submitted herself to the Word of God. Praise the Lord. And that's, that's what we're to do. That's what it means to become a Christian. We hear the Word. We believe the Word. We submit ourselves to the Word. And that's how... We become a Christian. And that, so Mary is an ideal believer, but she's also an ideal worshiper. Uh, after she had been told by the angel that she was going to have a baby, and uh, we looked at that last week, and the angel told her, your cousin Elizabeth is uh, six months pregnant with a miracle baby herself. And so she goes up to visit Elizabeth. And the Bible tells us that when she comes into the very house where Elizabeth is, yes. that the baby, who, who was John the Baptist, of course, the baby in the womb of Elizabeth leapt with joy. Amen. And that baby, it was like the very first person on earth to acknowledge Jesus as the coming Messiah was a fetus, <laughs> a baby in the womb. I'm sure glad that uh, Elizabeth didn't have an abortion because the first worshiper of Jesus was a baby in the womb. That didn't have anything to do with my sermon, but I just thought of that just uh, spur of the moment here. So... Uh, uh, this baby leapt in the womb and, and uh, Elizabeth said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Yes. And so when Mary heard that, when Elizabeth made that statement to Mary, Mary just burst into song. And she just begins to worship God. And she says, and in verse 46, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. And behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. That's what we're doing here today, aren't we? We're saying Mary was indeed blessed. She was a blessed believer and a blessed worshiper. And all generations... Uh, respect her, revere. We don't worship her, but we respect her and we revere her like we do other saints in the Bible. 
For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So I see in this passage a, a great pattern for worship. First of all, how we should worship. How does Mary worship God? She worships Him, first of all, from the inside first. Her worship begins, she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. It started on the inside. Now it worked its way to the outside. And I want you to know, that's God's pattern for your worship and my worship. It must begin inside and then it may express itself outwardly in a variety of ways. Some people are very, very expressive in their worship. When I was in Liberia, my goodness, I just, I, it was an athletic workout almost to, uh, to, to see the people worship there. I felt a little bit inhibited, to tell you the honest truth, because my expression of my worship is not quite as uh, volatile as theirs. But I enjoyed it. And I have an idea that God enjoyed it. Amen. As they jumped and danced and whirled and, and, and worshipped God with a great expression. However, God looks upon every expression of worship and He looks deeper than what we do on the outside. Amen. He looks on the inside. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. One of the complaints of the prophets in ancient Israel was that the people went through all their religious observances, but their heart wasn't right. Isaiah said, you, you worship me with your voice, but your heart is far from me. And what God wants first of all is for our heart, our soul, our spirit to rejoice in God, our Savior. And so for Mary, it was an internal matter. It started on the inside and expressed itself on the outside. But not only was it internal, it was also intense. The words here for magnify, the words here for exalt are strong words. God wants our worship to be intense. I have an idea that as Baptists, we are probably guilty to some degree of less intensity in our worship than God would really like to see. Now, I can't really speak for God here, but I just, uh, I don't know, I, having been in places where people are much more intense, much more expressive, and I just know that... Uh, in all of our other relationships, we like to express great joy with a little more intensity. You go to a football game and you just hear people just, ah, you know, they're just going crazy with excitement because their team kicks a field goal or scores a touchdown, or hits a home run, or something like that. And there's intensity in that. But sometimes, as Christians, and I, I, I know I've already confessed that I'm a little guilty of this too, sometimes as Christians, we can just experience the greatest blessings of the Lord, and just, well, amen. Praise the Lord. When maybe God would like it if we got a little more excited. And I don't know, you know, I, I know I know personalities differ and I know that congregations differ and, and I know that it's wrong to try to whip up uh, false 
excitement and things like that. But I'm just saying that I want to be more intense in my worship. And uh, I want to be more intense in my expression of love for the Lord. And the Bible just tells us to make a joyful noise, to, to sing with, with strength, to worship the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And that involves the body as well. So any of you just want to holler amen right now? Amen. All right. That's a little more intense. Okay. So, uh, but that's what I see here, that, that Mary worshiped God internally, started on the inside, and then there was an intensity to her worship. And then there was a continuousness to her worship. These, these uh, verbs here in the Greek are all in present progressive tense. It's not like she just did it one time. It's not like we come to church on Sunday morning and we worship God and then we go home and we forget about Him the rest of the week. No, it is a, a continual kind of thing. We are aware of His presence. We're aware of His blessing. We're aware of His greatness. We're aware of His glory. And we worship Him in a continuous kind of way. And on the job, or if we're Amen. cutting our grass or raking the leaves or whatever, whatever we're doing, we can do it to the glory of God. The Bible says whatever you do, in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. Amen. Some of my most favorite worship time is when I'm walking my dog or when I'm driving in the car. Uh, usually my dog's with me there too. So my dog gets to see my intensity. Maybe you don't get to see it very much, but my dog gets to see my uh, my worship. But I just break forth in song sometimes and just sing to the Lord. And uh, so far my dog hadn't howled. We used to have a dog that would howl when I would sing. But uh, but Buffy doesn't do that. So uh, I, I just, I want my worship not to be a weekly thing. Not even to be just a morning I want it to be a continuous awareness day in and day out of how great he is and how much he loves me and how much I love him back. So, so how we worship, it's internal, it's intense, it's continuous. And then the main thing that she emphasized, that it is done humbly. It is humble. Humble worship. Sometimes, as American Christians, we kind of at least exhibit the idea that we are special and that's why God loves us. Now the truth is, God loves us and that's why we are special. Amen. It's not the other way around. Amen. And God's love for us should always humble us. Mary says, you're, you have, have brought the proud to nothing. And you've lifted up the humble. Pride is the parent sin of all sins. Amen. And humility is the doorway into all true worship. When Mary began to worship, she just noticed how many times she says, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. And it says, he has shown strength and scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty. He has exalted those of humble estate. Humility is the key to genuine, true worship. If you look at Isaiah chapter 66, the very last chapter of Isaiah, the first two or three verses talks about where God lives, where God dwells. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, which says, The Lord says, Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What house could you build for me? What is the place of my rest. In other words, you, you couldn't build a place big enough for me. And then he says in verse 2 where he dwells. All these things my hand has made 
And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's what God delights in. God says, I will make my dwelling not in some massive temple that Solomon builds or that Herod builds or that some other person may build. Those may all be nice, but that's not really where I live. I will dwell with those who are humble in heart and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Trembles with excitement. Trembles with amazement. So, how we worship? Internal first. Intense expression. Continuous and with humility. So who do we worship? Well, we worship God. We worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that we sing, Father, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And did we sing the verse, Spirit, I love you, we didn't? But that, that, that verse is in there too. We love the triune God. We worship Him. We worship the Father for designing and determining and planning the whole redemptive story. We worship the Son for actually coming and fulfilling and carrying out that story and dying on the cross for our sin and being raised from the dead. And we worship the God, the Holy Spirit, as the one who gathers his, the people of God together, con convicting them of sin, converting their hearts, and combining them together into one body, the body of Christ. So we worship God. We worship Him. And then, uh, why do we worship? Well, we worship because He is worthy of our worship. Yes. We worship Him because He says, He has done great things. Yes. What has God done for you that causes you to worship Him? He has done great things. He's forgiven our sins. He's taken away the reproach. The Bible says that He has put away our sins as far as the east is from the west. He has cast them into a bottomless sea and He'll never, never, never bring them up against us again. That's wonderful. God has done great things. You know, there are things in my past that I can't forget. Things I'm ashamed of. Things I wish I'd never done. Things that still plague me from time to time. But I know this. That if I go to God and say, God, you know that, that sin that I confessed to you 50 years ago? And God says, mm, what sin? What, what sin are you talking about? I say, well, God, you know that sin... God says, you know, I, I, don't, I don't remember that sin against you anymore. I forgave that when you very first asked me. And I'll never bring it up again. And then I think he might say, and I kind of wish you'd quit bringing it up. <laughs> Instead of moaning about my sin, I need to be shouting about God's grace and his mercy. Me. So he has done great things. And the list could just be endless. We just came through the season of Thanksgiving and we kind of mentioned that it's, it's good sometimes to just make a list of things that God has done, blessings that he's poured out on our life. And uh, I can remember when I was a little boy, my mother would tell us to, to count our blessings. And sometimes at the dinner table, she would say, let's just talk about ways that we're blessed and we would begin to go around the table talking about things we were thankful for ways that we were blessed and the truth is all of us are blessed Amen. far far more than most people in the rest of the world Amen. we are indeed blessed and so many times Somehow or another, that understanding of our blessings 
just puffs us up rather than humbles us. It makes us think we're special instead of recognizing that God is gracious. One of the most joyful people that I ever met in my life was a girl that was actually cooking for us while I was in Liberia. She was always singing and just rejoicing and just so happy in the Lord. She loved Jesus so much. And I was always encouraged by her. She was probably in her early 30s. And uh, she had gone with us, the missionary group, and she was preparing our meals while we were there that week at the missionary compound. And I just got talking to her one day. I just kind of assumed that she probably had just had a, a blessed life. And I said something to her about uh, her being so joyful, so happy, so just overjoyed all the time. And I said, uh, it just seems like you probably hadn't had too much bad happen in your life. And she just shamed me so much. She said, oh, she said, uh, when the rebels invaded our village, said they lined all of us up and they killed every fifth person, macheted them to death, and I had to watch that. And said, then they took my father, who was kind of the leader of the group, and they put him on the ground, nailed his hands to the ground, and melted plastic and poured it on his body until it killed him. And I had to watch. And she said, and then the worst part was the rest of the night, I was assaulted by soldiers, by 40 different soldiers throughout the night. By this time, I'm crying. And I'm thinking, well, I, I was so wrong. And I said, I, I, I was just was so amazed at how joyful you are. She said, I have many reasons to be joyful. Yes. She said, God has saved my life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Said God has blessed me with salvation. God has redeemed me. I'm His. Yes. And she said, why would I not be happy? Amen. And I went back to my room and prayed and repented and wept for about 30 minutes and saying, God, I've never been through anything like what she or any, anything even close to what she's talking about. And so often, my heart is not singing. And her heart was always singing. And I just, uh, I just would say the reason we worship is because God has blessed us so much. And every one of us, and we've been blessed with multitudes of physical blessings, material blessings. But if we took all of those away and all we had left was just Jesus, Amen. I want you to know we would still have magnitudinous reasons Amen. to worship Amen. and say, Jesus, you're all I have, but you are all I need. So this morning, I encourage you to worship. Worship as Mary did. Internally, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices. And then with intensity. And then continuously. And then humbly. Worship Him because He has done great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this song of Mary. I thank you that you had Luke record it so that we could hear it and understand it 20 centuries later. And to know that just as she sang and worshipped you, you are calling us to be that kind of a worshiper. And Father, I pray that you will help us to set our affection on you, to love you with all of our heart, with 
with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our physical strength as well. And I pray that if there's a person here this morning who has not received that grace, that this might be the day in Jesus' name. Are you a Christian? Are you a worshiper? You say, well, I've gone to church a, long, a lot or, or I've tried to live a pretty good life or whatever. That, none, none of that really matters as far as God is concerned. God is just asking, what is in your heart? What do you think of me? What do you think of me? And the word repent is the Greek word that means to change your thinking, to change your mind. And what God wants us to think of Him, that He is great, that He is good, and that He has graciously sent His Son yes. to die in our place. Yes. If you've not received Him, I invite you to come this morning. You say, well, how do I come? How can I come? You come just as Mary came. You come just as as you are, just as you are, as we stand together and as we sing.